All right, guys, welcome to a brand new episode. If you're new to the channel, I'm Steve and this is my barn. And behind me is my 1991 850i that I've been working on for the last three years or so. So if you've seen any of my previous content, I've basically been rebuilding the whole external aspect of the engine and the engine still isn't running properly. So I spent the guts of six or seven grand now on this car and it's still not running right. So I want to get working on the bodywork and suspension brakes, all that kind of stuff. And I can't until this bloody engine is working properly. So, well, I'm staring at it right now. I've invested in a two post lift as I spill my tea everywhere. As you can see, this is a lift from Redmount here in Dundalk. And uh, so I'm after getting that installed in this rented space. As you can see, it just makes things so much easier. So my plan is, as you've probably seen from the thumbnail, is to get that engine out. Um, and send it off for proper rebuilding of the top end. Now, the reason I've come to that conclusion, I'll basically detail in the next 15 minutes or so. So please don't skip ahead to the end for the exciting stuff, because the next 10, 15 minutes kind of lead me to the conclusion as to why I'm taking the action that I am, if that makes any sense. So uh, yeah, I'll basically pick up where I left off from the last video, which is me essentially stumped, and we can go from there. All right, guys, check this out. You can see what I'm after finding. This is the upper section of the fuse box, which I now have removed. Once you have those screws out, you can basically pull the whole frame up and off the relays. So you can push the relays down through the frame. You can see all the receiving uh, kind of sockets there. But basically each of the relays and the respective sockets are now kind of completely loose and independent. And that gives me access to the full accessory block here and allows me to flip it up and just take a look at this damage here on the underside. So those cables there are completely charred, as you can see. Look how bad that is. So there's absolutely no question. Like I mentioned, I was getting continuity between the fuel pump uh, blades here on the top and, um, well, this section here, this, this charred fuse block. So I absolutely need a new one of these. I was thinking basically I could Dremel this out and then basically pass the cables up through it and kind of fuse it separately. So that's always an option. These are NLA, no longer available from the dealer, I checked, but I do have a lead on one from the UK, so fingers crossed that comes up uh, with a positive result. But I think in the meantime, just to, so it doesn't hold up the diagnosis of the rest of the engine, I'm gonna get them clipped, make them safe, and that'll allow me to continue with the rest of the job at hand. So let's get at it. That's both of the cables clipped off now. It's an absolute mess down here and the cables are actually melted onto the cables beside them. And as you can see, this one has been clipped away. But look at this beside it. This is a headlight flasher. So there's a chance there was continuity with that cable too. Look at the damage there. Let's get these wrapped up anyway and continue with the job. Okay, so moving back to the fuel pumps, I now have both of my batteries reconnected, all the fuses are back in, and I've hooked up my fuel pressure gauge to this location on the car. So we basically have the fuel tank here, and you've got the embedded fuel pump assembly, which has both of the fuel pumps. Uh, each line, so a line comes out of each fuel pump, goes into the fuel filter, which is up here, and then this is just after the fuel filter. So I've already done a test on one of the lines, and it is holding pressure after the ignition is turned off and I've since swapped this onto the other line. As you can see, I've got a T here and this one is not holding pressure. So once the, the ignition is turned off, once it stops cranking, pressure is lost. It just drops to zero again. And you may be wondering how on earth is that possible? You just had the fuel pump rebuilt and I did, um, but I had it rebuilt using the Bosch fuel pumps that I supplied as in brand new Bosch fuel pumps. And supposedly they aren't as reliable as you might think, even brand new ones. So just take a look at this. I'm just going to crank the engine and you'll see straight away that the fuel pressure drops off. And I can actually hear some kind of like a rewind as if one of the pumps goes, ooh, as in, you know, backwards. Um, now it's either fuel pressure loss in one of the lines in the pump or it's one of the pumps itself. Basically there's like a little check valve or a valve in the pump that stops the fuel from coming back out again and it, it may well be failing, I, I don't know yet. So another thing that I've done is I've also clamped off. So basically that fuel pressure gauge, that line runs all the way up to here. 
and I've clamped off the fuel pressure gauge just here with a pair of vice grips and done the exact same test just to basically rule out any kind of leakage in the engine or the engine bay. And sure enough, it's the same thing, it's losing pressure. So the pressure loss is somewhere between basically the front wheel there, as in where the fuel line goes up, and the actual fuel pump. So what I'm gonna do is take that fuel pump out. I'm gonna swap it with another fuel pump and see if that fixes the issue. And so my PC power supply is coming very handy once again. I have it rigged up to the top of the fuel pump and with the flick of a switch, I can activate and deactivate the fuel pump and it highlights even more how much the fuel pump isn't holding any pressure. Very strange. It's safe to say I'm a dab hand at getting these things out now, so about three minutes later, here it is on the bench. Now, based on where I had the 12 volt supply connected, which was to this pin here, and based on the fact that this line here was holding fuel pressure and this one wasn't, I can basically route both the line and the wire to the respective pump that's causing the issue. And in this case, it's not this pump, it's the one on the inside. So I'm just going to detach this from the frame, get it removed, and get it replaced. Right, now I can get at the rear fuel pump. So this is potentially the bad pump. Let's stick in another one and see what happens. And here's the new fuel pump. I went with a Stark fuel pump for this one. Just doing a quick size comparison. Everything looks nearly identical. Sometimes you can't beat Amazon for the likes of this. I got an entire set of clamps. Sometimes you do overpay with Amazon, but you do get exactly what you need. This is the correct size that I need for this particular tube. That's nice and tight. And the last thing to go back on is the filter. That's it, ready to roll. That was actually pretty straightforward. Let's get it back in the car. It can be a little bit fiddly getting the fuel pump back in, but I've done it so many times now that it's fairly straightforward. It only takes about three, four minutes to do it. And I've basically just hooked up my PC power supply once again. Um, and we're going to just build some pressure with this pump and see if it maintains it. So I haven't done this off camera, so this is the first time I've done it. I'm going to flick the switch here and try and get my eyeball on this pressure gauge. Let's see what happens. So that's the pump running. And it's holding pressure. Running again. And it's holding pressure. Fantastic. So what's that? That's sitting bang on three bar and it's holding it. And I'm going to come back to that now in a few minutes and just to see how much it drops by. I'm just coming back to this now about 15 minutes later and it's sitting at about 2.2, 2.3 bar, something like that. So it's definitely holding pressure now. Uh, that other fuel pump, the Bosch one, brand new and pure junk seem to fail, not holding any pressure at all. So I'll get these unplugged and I'll get the actual power supply connected. And then this is the fuel level sensor. And we can start the car. Once 
Once again, I have both of my batteries connected. I have the key in the ignition. Let's see how this sounds. Nearly. Come on! Hmm. You know what guys, sometimes you just have to walk away from the car when it's annoying you, you're scratching your head, you can't figure things out. I'm after coming back to the car now the following evening and straight away I'm only after noticing this and I did notice it last night, basically on startup of the ignition, that's ignition 2, you see the far left, the EML light, which is the throttle body light, is staying on. So it basically does its own self-test, its self-check. Uh, on ignition two and that light should extinguish after two or three seconds and it's not and I will explain why and how this EML system actually works. So this here is one component of BMW's EML system. Now this system basically originated around the time that BMW was transitioning to drive-by-wire systems. So there was no throttle linkage controlling the throttle bodies. And obviously with this V12, we have two throttle bodies and this is one of them. So the EML system basically comprises both of these throttle bodies. You also have the EML unit as well, which sits behind the DMEs in the engine bay. And you have the accelerator pedal as well. So it was a basic enough system, but pretty advanced for the time. And it obviously involved Whenever you depress the accelerator pedal, you're activating a potentiometer. That data is delivered to the EML control unit. A small bit of processing is done, and then depending on various other parameters like engine speed, temperature, all that kind of thing, um, the position of the throttle plate would be determined and then transmitted to the actual throttle body. So these throttle bodies are essentially DC motors mounted straight onto a, a throttle plate. And they're very robust, very, very robust, in fact, especially the, the gear assembly itself. But because there is small, delicate electronics in here, uh, as there is in the EML unit itself, um, they're 30 years old now, and they're beginning to fail and cause issues. Now, these throttle bodies, they can actually be cleaned and refurbed. You probably saw in my last video, I did actually have both of them open. Now, I only gave them a rudimentary clean. I didn't go too in-depth with it. Essentially, Bosch that makes these units, uh, or originally made these units, they have anti-tamper screws to stop people interfering with the internals, which is no bad thing, probably. Um, and you can basically overcome them pretty easy, pop the motors off, and you can access about 50, 60% of the internals, and that's essentially what you need to clean up. I basically used a bit of emery cloth, cleaned up the commutators, removed any carbon, checked the brushes, and basically just popped it back together. Um, but in my efforts, and I'll show you now what I did, I actually caused a small bit of damage to this particular unit. As you can see here, there's two wiper arms inside the actual um, DK assembly itself. And they basically tell the EML unit the position of the throttle plate. The two little kind of wiper arms that slide along tracks. And I caught one of them on my sleeve, the expert genius that I am. Um, so I thought I could bend them back into shape and they'd work no, no problem at all. But these need to be incredibly precise. And as you can see from the state that they're in, they basically just do not operate correctly. Well, that, that one that's bent out of shape does not operate correctly. And the reason it doesn't operate correctly and why it's potentially causing issues is the EML system has a lot of redundancy built into it, uh, whereby when you turn the key to ignition two, the EML system will do a full entire self-check. Every single component will set values back to the EML unit. And the EML unit is not happy with any of the values that it receives. It will basically shut down the engine. Um, even imagine if, for example, you're on the motorway or the highway and your accelerator pedal gets stuck. Um, 
basically the EMS system will, as that element of redundancy, whereby you can actually shut down the throttle valves and close the plates and it'll cut half the engine down or whatever respective side is causing an issue. Um, so again, on ignition two, if it's not receiving values that it's happy with, boom, the engine will basically be cut off. Um, and I'm thinking that's what's happening in mine. Regardless of that, like I mentioned, these things are 30 years old now. I'm gonna send these off to the experts. I neither have the expertise nor the bench testing equipment or ability to do a proper refurb of these. Um, so I'm gonna send these off to Wolf in Germany. If you Google Wolf E31, uh, he is an E31 genius and they can do a full refurb and hopefully repair that wiper arm. It's the kind of damage that may or may not be either repairable or replaceable. Um, but he's gonna take a look at it for me. And worst case, I'm gonna to have to get a whole new refurbished unit, which is about 550 quid. They're not cheap, but it beats paying two grand for a brand new one. So I'm gonna send both these off to Germany. Hopefully when they come back, the car runs and stays running. Three weeks later, and all my stuff is back. So I sent off quite a bit of stuff to Wolf in Woke Performance in Germany. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it. Like I said, it's been three weeks since I sent stuff off, so I can't even remember. But I did send off both engine computers for testing. He basically said, you're sending over the other stuff, send them over and I can do a code readout. So he basically plugged both of them into his test car. He's got an 850i over there. He's got countless <laughs> 850s over there. Um, and he basically pulled the codes and the DMEs uh, basically had nothing stored on them at all. Um, interestingly, the car that he had them on, the car actually didn't crank, well, sorry, it cranked, but didn't fire up. Um, but after a bit of kind of footering around, plugging stuff in and out, then the car started up just fine. So the DMEs appear to be okay. Throttle bodies, despite my misgivings about the work that I did and the condition that I thought they were in, these worked absolutely fine on his test car. Um, there's no EML code stored. Um, EML light extinguished straight away. He did open them up, so he did a cursory check of, I suppose, what I did, um, and the, just to check the general condition of them. They're absolutely fine. Uh, the butterfly plates here, they aren't sticking in any way. He did ask me if I wanted to go more in depth and take out the, the gear set and the like and refurbish them, but they don't cause any issues in his eyes, so I was happy to leave them as they are. They're incredibly high quality, rock solid components, so there's no point in doing that. And like I mentioned, he also pulled the EML codes and there was nothing stored at all. So leaves me a little bit stumped as to where to go next. Um, does that kind of point, point towards my wire harness causing issues with the EML light staying on? I'm kind of hoping I plug all this back in and my EML light just extinguished straight away. Straight away? Straight away. So we'll have a look and see what happens. I'll go from there. Right, that is everything reconnected. I still have my fuel pressure gauge in line there, so I'm just gonna leave that. DME's email reconnected, throttle bodies reconnected, all plugs at the front here checked. And I think we're ready to go. Batteries are topped up. I'm just gonna turn on the ignition. And I hope to God the EML goes out. And it does. Sorry, you guys just missed that. EML far left, and it goes out. Brilliant. So there's no fuel pressure, it needs to build a bit. Hmm, nearly there. It actually sounds strong when it's running. One more. Come on. One more for luck. Hmm.
All right, guys, so just bear with me one second. Um, one of you guys made a comment in my last video. I think it was around the introduction of the video when I said something along the lines of, I'm not a mechanic, I only have so much time to be working on the car. And his comment was, you know what, you're right, you're not a mechanic, but the issue is staring you in the face. Uh, your valves are sticking. And that got me thinking back to when I did my stem seals. I only had a few short clips of it in the last video, I think, or sorry, the video before last. And I had an awful time trying to get my valves to seal properly. As in, plenty of the cylinders were fine. I could basically force air into the cylinder, the valves would be kept up, and I did the stem seal no problem. But there was multiple valves that would not seal. So I'd inject air into the cylinder and the air would be pissing out. And I was like, maybe they're not properly sealed. So I'd rotate the engine twice, still pissing out, I'd rotate it again, and then they might seal slightly better. Um, and that was across, Jesus, maybe seven or eight different valves. Um, but I didn't really think anything of it. Um, but then I thought, hold on a minute, I actually have a video of the day I received the car. So the day it was delivered off the transporter, came from the UK, landed here in Ireland, I drove it about 100 meters to, this, to my parking spot and I recorded the exhaust and the engine running. So this is that video. And as you can see, the left side exhaust isn't running properly. In fact, the symptoms it's displaying, the level of misfiring that you can see in here is exactly the same as it is now. So despite all the work that I've done to the engine, none of it has resolved that issue. And the only thing that I haven't looked at is the internals of the engine, as in the valve train, and obviously the lower end, the bottom end. What I've done since, I suppose the last clip just passed a few minutes ago, um, I've done a, another compression test, and it's still absolutely fine. So I did a compression test about two years ago, and it was perfect. Another compression test now is still perfect. It's exactly the same results. But I did a leak town test, which I didn't really bother recording because it's quite a boring process, but there's a significant loss. Let me just show you here. I don't know if it's going to really show on the wide angle lens. Um, but these are, so if you just, they're all my compression results, which are fine. Um, and I have a firing order list here, but this is on the one, one side of the engine, and I've got 50% loss, 45% loss, 40% loss, 25% loss, 30 to 35% loss, 45% loss. So a huge amount of loss on that side, and in fairness, the other bank was mostly okay. I think there was one cylinder I was getting something like 25 to 55% loss, something like that. Um, but I also took a quick clip uh, at the exhaust uh, with a small bit of tissue, as you can see here. So I was basically just holding in front of the exhaust, and as you can see, there seems to be a large amount of sucking and blowing going on. I did the same test on my 7 Series and it was absolutely smooth as butter, just kind of gently being pushed away from the exhaust. And here you can see it's just all over the place. Um, I would, I'm fully aware that this is far from a conclusive test, but it's always interesting to do this kind of thing just to see if there's any level of suction going on, and there definitely seems to be. So this has led me to the conclusion that I want to get both heads rebuilt. And to do that, the engine essentially needs to come out. It'll also give me more access to the engine bay uh, because there is some rust repairs to be done there as well. And I was also thinking, if this is going to be a full restoration, bodywork wise, exhaust, suspension, brakes, the whole thing, do I really want it? Will I really be happy with the level of work that I've done to the engine? I know I've done quite a bit to it, but the inside of the engine hasn't been looked at. So this, I'm happy with the bottom end. The compression is good. But the top end, there's a big question mark over that. So I think now's the time to do it. Get the engine out. Like I say, it allows me to get at that engine bay area. And also I can send the heads off for a professional rebuild. So, and I suppose one last thing. Everyone's probably thinking, what the hell is this guy doing? He's doing everything completely backwards. He should have done this three years ago. Just pull the engine. Absolutely, I should have. There's no question. Um, but... In my defense, the car was in my garage. I had this much space between my garage door and the front of my car. I had no lift. Um, I didn't have a flat floor. I had no engine hoist. I had no tools, no expertise. Um, I suppose at that point, all I'd done was suspension work and brakes and uh, oil changes, that kind of thing. Taking on an engine out job on an 8 Series I just bought. Uh, I suppose I thought I'd get away with the level of work that I did and the, the car would be perfect, but it seems to be far from it. So 
That's my excuse. Let's get this engine out of the car. I suppose with the car in the air, I might as well give you guys your first tour of the underside of the 8 Series. So you're gonna see a lot of rust. Some of it's bad, some of it is extremely bad. So here's the back side of the right wheel, front right wheel, uh, front left wheel. Huge amounts of rust and corrosion. Anything that can be blasted and brought back will be, but otherwise everything else is gonna be replaced. Notably all suspension components. I already have new shocks, lower control arms. We've got the upper arms, we've got tie rod ends, drop links, um, the center stabilizer, all the bushings. Uh, we've got the center link for the steering. Everything there is just gonna be replaced. Uh, front, front subframe is actually pretty decent. That's gonna be dropped with the engine. So again, once it's outside of the car, I can uh, actually uh, blast that and see what it looks like when it's outside the car, but otherwise it looks pretty decent. I already did the engine mounts uh, previously. Uh, moving back through the car, this ZF uh, four speed. Uh, it's actually not original to the car. Looking back through the car's history, it's a refurbed unit. We've got a bit of a leak going on there. I'm not even sure how it shifts, to be honest with you. So it may be a case of while it's out of the car, send it off for a bit of a, a lock or a refurb. This car failed multiple times on rust, rust repairs with the National Car Test in the UK over the last few decades. All original jack points are gone, they're lost. Um, so we've had multiple repairs, as you can see. New sections have been basically welded in. Rear jack points are completely gone. So all four of them, potentially both sills, need to be replaced in their entirety. Uh, interestingly enough, this line here, which leads to nowhere, completely rusted and corroded and basically sucking air into the engine. This is the vent valve from the actual fuel tanks that leads through the charcoal canister in the engine bay and gets sucked back into the engine. And it's going absolutely nowhere. So that could be contributing to poor engine running. Who even knows at this stage? Uh, exhaust, as you guys have probably noticed, and I've mentioned previously, it's a non-original exhaust. It's a power flow exhaust. Uh, from here backwards, it's non-original. Cats are missing. so. I'm not even sure what I want to do with this, to be honest, because I am a stickler for OEM, but an OEM exhaust from BMW is absolutely monstrous money. Uh, so we'll have to decide what we're doing there. Rear suspension, I mean, there's nothing even salvageable there. Look at the state of that. Again, the English roads, Midlands up, this car came from Birmingham, so mid UK, and the amount of salt they use on the roads is just absolutely criminal. Rear subframe may not even be salvageable, to be honest. It may be a case of getting it down, blasting it, see what it looks like. But otherwise, we may be looking at a complete replacement. Uh, and this rear wheel well, gone completely as well, because the whole windscreen washer system is actually the reservoirs in the back. Uh, you get a huge amount of corrosion if ever it leaks, and it just destroys the wheel well. So we're going to need a whole new one of them. And I suppose the only good thing about this car is these 95% or so Kumos on the back and they're going to be replaced with some nice Michelins whenever the time comes. So that's the underside of the car. Let's keep going with getting this exhaust removed. Let's start with this center bracket that connects both of the exhausts together. That's all six disconnected. We have another bracket here about a third of the way down. Instead of removing the muffler from the hanger, I'm just gonna remove the hanger itself. Now last but not least, there's a center bracket here that holds it all together. Whoa, that's heavier than it looks. I'm gonna raise this up a bit. There we go. And that's one side of the exhaust removed. Next task is to remove this heat shield. Well, 
size are these little suckers? Jeez, they don't look like tens. Yikes. Next up is this exhaust hanger and I suppose protective bracket. I have penetrating fluid on all of these nuts on the prop going into the diff. And unfortunately they all need to be removed manually as you can't get a socket in there. Go. Can't beat a bit of heat. All right, that's the last nut off the prop shaft and that can now be disconnected from the diff as soon as I disconnected it at the transmission. I can only see this exhaust hanger getting in the way, so I'm gonna take that off too. The next step that I can see is the transmission mount needs to be lowered so I can actually get at these nuts and you definitely need to support the transmission because this is basically the only transmission mount um, well at the rear section of the transmission otherwise it's just bolted into the back side of the engine so I'm going to support the transmission then I can remove the mount and get at the connection up here Okay, that's the mount off. And now we can get at the bolts on the back of the flange here. This does differ from the manual. Basically it is like a kind of a nut and a bolt uh, setup on the manuals, but on the automatic, it's just a single bolt that goes straight through. Oh, that's a large bolt, that's a 16 or 17. I was actually wrong, they're 18 mil. I'm not going to fully remove this first one, I'm going to leave them all in, get them all loosened and then take them out one by one. So in theory, I should really mark the position of the center bearing on the actual prop shaft because the position of it is actually quite important. You're supposed to basically preload this mount uh, before you tighten it down. But because I have the repair manual here and I have all the information to hand as to basically how to do it on reassembly, I'm not going to mark it. I'm just going to pull the bolts out and remove the prop shaft. So I need to be able to drop this impact. Okay, and off it comes. Okay, not too heavy. It's also good practice to make sure that the flange is completely covered like that so you don't get any dirt or dust or grime into the connections and the same on the prop itself. I just want to finish off today and while the car is still in the air, I'm probably going to remove the center stabilizer link and the drop links as well. So there isn't even the slightest chance of these drop links coming off easily. They're just pure junk. I'm just gonna chop right through them and get them off that way. Woo. Right, I wanna get this on the ground and we can start on the engine bay.
This will be fun. Once again, the mighty M70 V12 is about to get some major disruptions. So I suppose the goal today is to disconnect anything that actually connects the engine to the car itself. And there's quite a bit. So I suppose to start with, we have the wiring loom that connects up to the ECUs that needs to be disconnected. We have this fuel return is here. We have the air conditioning system needs to get disconnected. Coolant system has various connect points of connection to the engine, so that needs to come apart as well. Intake system, I already have one side removed. What else? Hydraulic, so power steering slash braking system, that's also connected. Uh, wiring harness also connects to the alternator, so that needs to come off. Uh, ignition system, so we bought ignition coils, all that needs to be disconnected. Some random power points. Um, yeah, and probably other stuff I'm forgetting. But some of those things aren't actually too bad. I mean, fuel can be disconnected very quickly. Cooling will be disconnected very quickly. Intake will be connected or disconnected very quickly. So instead of rambling about it, let's get stuck in. Ignition coil. Other ignition coil. I'm just going to disconnect both of these fuel hoses. These are just crappy temporary fuel hoses. They're not even the right kind of style. That's one disconnected. And the second. The fuel return line is an easy one. It's just down here at the right side of the engine. And there's a small hose clamp there. That's it off. While I'm here, I'm going to disconnect both of the temperature sensors going into the back of each of the intake manifolds. Also on this section of the wire harness is the diagnostic port and that comes off with just a little clip and that disconnects. And we've got one more connection down here. This is for the aircon compressor. We also have both of these connection points on the right side ignition coil and they both need to be disconnected. Speaking of aircon, both of these connections into the side of the compressor need to be undone. And of course my system is completely unpressurized as there isn't a drop of gas in the entire system. While I'm down here, we also have the engine ground strap as well to sort out. I've just lifted the car in the air again and I'm just draining the radiator as you can see just before I start pulling the radiator hoses. Staying with the coolant, we have some coolant lines on the back of the engine that need to be disconnected. And there's another one over this side of the engine, the one that connects to the rear coolant channel. And that's that one disconnected. I'm back at the front end of the engine. I'm going to focus my attention on disconnecting everything that's at the front section here. Shite. <laughs> and that she comes. So with the cooling system sorted out, I can move on to the wiring harness and I'm going to basically disconnect everything here and lift the harness onto the top of the engine. That's everything disconnected, including the relay sockets. And it should now lift up out of place. And it does. And I just need to finish disconnecting these terminals here. Of course, it makes sense to label everything first. Oh, two more ground straps here. Nice. And this is where the engine base stands now. So as you can see, bucket loads of room there for the engine just to lower down. And we have the entire harness removed. That's the ECU box there. Everything's disconnected down here, apart from the steerage linkage, that needs to be disconnected. And there's a few more hydraulic lines on this side. And we should be ready to roll. 
Just to speed things up a bit, I've done a bit of work off camera. So I've disconnected all the hoses off the bottom of the oil filter housing. So there's two lines and then third line on the side. Uh, we have another hydraulic line here disconnected off the reservoir here. And there's another line here just below it. Uh, actually, sorry, that's one of the oil lines. There's another line in there anyway that basically runs over to the uh, steering box. So that's been disconnected also. And I disconnected all the battery leads. So one of the lines runs down to the alternator. That's been disconnected. And then the other one runs down to the starter motor. So that's also been disconnected. So everything here on this side of the engine is now disconnected. Okay, so apologies in advance for the background noise. There's a, basically a storm blowing outside. So the whole barn is shaking and everything's rattling and banging. What I want to tackle tonight is the right side suspension. Last night I basically took off the left side strut tower, all control arms, all that kind of stuff. It involved a lot of cutting. And as you'll see, it's going to be pretty much the same thing on this side. So I'm not using my impact bit because I can't find the bloody thing. So this will have to do. For such an old car, these wheels are just lifting off. Every one of these screws is just completely gone. I find that the best way to separate these is with two pairs of pliers and just pull them apart. So that's the wheel speed sensor. On the other side, I had the wear sensor for the brake pad as well to contend with, but it's just the one on this side. I'm actually going to leave this connection to last so it's not leaking all over me. So we're back under the car and I know from my experience on the opposite side, the track rod end, no point in even trying to remove it. So I'm just going to cut it straight off. Lower control arm, easy peasy. We just got a 19 mil here. Like I say, easy peasy. And then lastly, on the upper arm, we've got this big bad boy here. This is a 22 mil. And you need quite a bit of torque to get this off. Jesus, that one's tight. Jesus. <laughs> there we go. And that's it. Disconnected. At this point, I'm going to disconnect the brake hose. On the opposite side, I actually had to cut this off because it's completely seized. But I can actually unscrew this one, thank God. Yeah, it's not coming off on this side either, so I'm just going to cut it off. And just after trimming this line, it's going to make it a whole lot easier to remove, as you can see. And that's the brake hose removed. And I should have removed the caliper at the start, so I'll do that now. I can't see a fucking thing. I'm really hoping this side is as easy as it was on the opposite side. Let's have a look. There's your answer. Let's swap to the big boys. <laughs> Piece of piss. There we go, one original ATE caliper. That's the ATE logo there. Might as well give this a go.
All right, the last step is to remove the three nuts on the top and it should be loose. I'm just gonna remove what is kind of like a secondary subframe, but it doesn't actually attach to the engine, but it is in the way. I just did another little bit of work there. I just disconnected the linkage from the side of the transmission and we also had another hydraulic line here and I disconnected that as well because that was connected to the body. And with the car back down on the ground again, I've also disconnected the steering linkage. So these U-joints here, if I can make it focus, there's a single uh, bolt hole as you can see and then there's another bolt hole here. Once they're both out, you can actually pull uh, the U-joint off the spline here. So that's actually completely loose. So the engine should just drop down and away from the linkage. And I think that's everything disconnected. I think we're pretty much ready to go here. Just a quick word on this platform here. So this is a 350 kilo max uh, extendable platform, as you can see. What I've done is I've actually just extended it by about 10 inches or so uh, because I wasn't confident with the actual size of the platform. So this probably weighs about 20 kilos, 25 kilos by itself. Uh, I've done some reading online. You guys have actually weighed the M70, kind of fully loaded with alternator, power steering pump, manifolds, everything on it, basically ready to run. That's about 240 kilos. The transmission, the four speed ZF unit is about 78 kilos. So we're talking in around 335, 340. Max lifts of this, as I say, is 350. We're right on the limit of what this thing can handle. Um, now I have drained all fluids as well out of the engine, so that's saving me probably in around 20 kilos or so. So, you know, we might be talking around 330-ish kilos, something like that. So we're right at the Q-max of this unit, but I think we should be okay. I'm not going to be directly under the car, and I'm going to use the locks on it as well once the weight is, um, I suppose, once I can lower it down. So, so the objective is to lower the transmission and the engine together and we basically have three subframe bolts here so we've got one two three same on the opposite side that's essentially all that's holding the engine to the actual uh, chassis itself and then if you remember from earlier on in the video we have this cross member here and that's the rear transmission mount and that's it there's nothing else holding it on so four bolts and six bolts at the front so we've ten bolts that come off and the engine should in theory drop straight down so let's give this a go let's get this lined up get it locked as well it should be noted as well i also have a stand at the back it's going to be supporting the diff so obviously we're going to be removing 300 kilos worth of weight from the front of the car we don't want it tipping backwards I'm just going to loosen these out ever so slightly, break them free. That's the first bit of movement. Now we're around the opposite side. Okay, so the table is now taking the full weight of the engine, I think. That's the full weight now on the table. Here we go, the moment of truth. Oh, right, okay. Bit of coolant. 
Well, that's scary. Okay, it seems to be slightly stuck, but it's resting nicely. Everything looks nice and straight and flat up here. I'm going to lift these stops up. Nice and slow. Okay, there's a few lines I'm going to have to disconnect. Everything looks good over here. Yeah, I just need to snip that off. The weight of the table looks good. I think if this table had a, a higher capacity weight, it wouldn't be jumping as much. Okay, all the hoses are still getting caught, including this transmission mount. We're nearly home and dry now. It's still a bit wobbly. Whoa, and bouncy. Fine adjustments with this just really aren't possible. And that's as far down as we're going to go. That's it, fully down. <laughs> that is one heavy engine. Man, I should have done this three years ago. All right guys, so we're back the following day. It's a beautiful sunny day, so I thought I'd open up the main door and we'll get a good look at this M70. So again, if only I had the ability and the space to take this out at the very start. Everything is so accessible now that the engine is out. As you can see, obviously the transmission is still attached. And like I mentioned, that's actually a refurbed unit from what I can tell from the service records. Uh, we've got a steering box here. There's numerous adjustments on this that can be made. So I'll have to worry about that whenever the whole thing is going back together. Everything looks pretty good and pretty clean. I mean, I did a lot of cleaning over the last few years, so everything looks pretty good. Again, the subframe doesn't look like it's the worst, so that should clean up pretty well. Uh, everything at the front of the engine obviously is so accessible now. Uh, if you remember, I had the alternator refurbed as well. Subframe on this side looks good too. Um, exhaust, these basically heat shields that attach to the outside of the exhaust. Um, are not in the best of nicks, so I may have to replace them. Um, I remember I had to cut through this heat shield to get at one of these exhaust bolts. Again, evidence of how difficult it was to do anything while the engine was actually in the engine bay. Um, and yeah, there's the plate for the gearbox. It's the 4HP24. And just coming around to the back of the engine, you can essentially see everything that I was working on blind essentially because you just couldn't see anything while it was in the engine bay again, just right up against the firewall. And speaking of which, let's have a quick look at the inside of the car. So there's the whole transmission tunnel. Um, horribly cracked as you'd expect, but it's 30 years old. And we've got all our coolant hoses here that I was working on. That's obviously the steerage linkage. We've got the Arcon lines there, all our hydraulic lines on the right side, a few lines here. Um, here, there's a good bit of rust here on the right side uh, rail, whereas there's none on the left side. Um, and aside from that, the front end actually looks relatively decent. It's not too bad. This plate underneath again has a bit of surface corrosion, but I may need to weld in a new plate there. So again, all relatively clean. Now we have our hydraulic pump and our brake booster and our reservoirs. 
and it's just a myriad of <laughs> hydraulic lines and brake lines and everything will have to be kept track of whenever this is all coming apart. Yeah. So that about wraps up this video and it is an understatement to say I am absolutely ecstatic that I got this engine out in one piece. I'm still in one piece, the car is still in one piece. So I think we can only call that a resounding success. So I think the next step for me is to get the top end of this engine apart get both of these heads off and then get them sent off to be professionally rebuilt. So I really want a pro to cast their eye over all the top end components, the cams, all the hydraulic lifters, the valves, the whole top end valve train and basically see what needs to be replaced, what needs to be refurbed and basically just to get a pro's opinion and then to get them to actually do it as well. So I haven't actually decided on an engine shop. So if you guys have any suggestions, please stick it down inside the comments. Um, and also if you have any other comments or queries or anything at all to stick in the comments, please do, because I love reading the comments and I love to hear what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong or what I could have done better. So please type away down in the comment section. Um, so I suppose getting these heads off, I see that being a relatively straightforward job. I'm fairly confident I can do that pretty damn quick. So the next video is going to be coming along extremely soon. So please uh, stay tuned for it. And I suppose the thing that I'm most apprehensive about is all the rust repairs on this body. So as you saw earlier on in the video, the back end is extremely bad. Both of these sills are extremely bad. All the jack points need to be redone. That right side rail is bad. And one thing that I haven't shown you is actually on the roof, there's a small section just above the A-pillar on the driver's side, which is rusted away. And by itself, you think, hmm, that's actually not too bad. But supposedly, once you cut that away, it can be rusted all the way down inside the roof, which requires an entirely new roof. So yeah, I'm really hoping that's not the case, but it could well be the case. So that's what I'm most apprehensive about. But I suppose once I have both of these heads off, um, I can get them sent off and then I can start worrying about the actual chassis getting all the other components out or the whole engine bay needs to be cleared out and then we can actually start doing some proper rust repairs so thanks for sticking with me throughout the video I hope you learned something I certainly did and the new video will be long extremely soon so thanks for tuning in guys and if you haven't subscribed please do see you in the next video